So I'm very excited to introduce to you David Braben, Chief Executive of Frontier Developments today for um, our AGM investor update. David and I have known each other for seven years now. And the VST first invested in Frontier Developments way back in 2013, actually just two months before the company floated on AIM. And I was introduced to David in an unusual way. Normally, when we make an investment, we're introduced via a broker, one of the brokers in London. But actually, almost uniquely with, uh, with Frontier Developments, I was introduced by um, a very long-standing, um, now long-standing friend of mine, who happens to still be chairman of the company, um, David Gammon. And I was having lunch with David Gammon one day in Cambridge, uh, where he lives and where Frontier Developments is based. And we were talking about companies that we thought were interesting. And he was saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm chairman of the company. We're going to float it. Of course, it won't be of interest to you. And as soon as he said that, of course, it was of interest to me. And uh, so we, I, we spoke about it for a while. And interestingly, I mean, it's, it's one of the, I was thinking about this earlier. It's one of the strange things that at the time, back in 2013, video games companies were something of an anathema on AIM. And that really reflected the experience of investors with video games companies in the period between about 2000 and 2010, when there are a number of listed AIM quoted companies, uh, all of which floundered, interestingly. So that, so that it, was, it felt like it was going to be not a walk in the park to float a video games company back then. And the reason that I got so interested in the company very quickly uh, was because David, <clears throat> David Gammon explained to me how there was a sea change going on uh, as a result of the advances in digital technology that video games developers were, had, a, had a window of opportunity to become video games publishers. And that's really been the journey of Frontier Developments over the last seven years and what we're going to discuss. So, David, looking back over this period, I, I, I'm curious to ask, you, to ask you, when you look back, what was your experience of floating like? And what, what were the, how do, how do you re reminisce on that now? It was, I remember signing inordinate numbers of documents, um, great big piles of documents where you, you see new versions of them and it's just not practical to read them end to end. Having said that though, the, the process was probably less painful than I was expecting. Um, in that I, I remember engaging with a lot of people. I think there was a lot of, there was a lack of interest in our sector for at least a year or so, even after we floated. And it was only when they started to see that Frontier was performing, that we were growing, and that we, do, we were doing sort of what we said we would do. And I think some of the things that we said back then, people rolled their eyes a bit and thought, oh yeah, right, they all say that. You know, like, our ambition is to be the highest um, quality company, you know, that, that we, we most respected, I think, is what we said. Um, you know, and this is sort of Rolls Royce, not Ford. We're going to make things that were memorable. Um, and I actually think, looking back, that's what we've done. You know, we've one after the other, we've said when we would do it, we've, we've done what we've said we'd do. Each of them has done slightly better than we said it, we thought it would do, which was good. You know, so we're on a really good trajectory. Um, and actually, if anything, you know, the transition that you mentioned at the start, um, I mean, rightly so, the move to digital is now, is, is the case, it, we're mostly through that transition, almost all our sales are digital. And I think this um, COVID issue, if we're allowed to talk about it, is, um, has actually accelerated that because what's happened is a lot more people now have moved to digital who might not have done so, so quickly. And actually are really engaging with our games because the type of games we make have hundreds of hours of, of interesting playtime in them, if you like. And I, I think that is exactly the sort of thing. If you're going to be banged up in a, a, a flat for weeks on end, at least you want something compelling and interesting. But also has a bit of a social element to it as well, because obviously you chat online to your friends and all that sort of thing. So I think um, in terms of sort of going back to the, the question, you know, uh, for me, even though uh, ironically at the time we did, we, we hesitated because the Kickstarter for Elite had been a lot more successful than, than actually we'd, we'd thought it would be, um, which is great, that's fantastic, don't get me wrong. Um, but what we didn't want to do, we were most of the way down the altar towards floating, um, and we decided to go through it with it anyway. And I think that was the right decision, because it meant we could accelerate things, and, and actually we've not looked back. You know, it's been great for us, it's been really good. You know, the, I, I'd like to think that our relationship with investors is still very good, I think we've continued to keep people posted with what's coming as best we can, even though occasionally we've done RNSs, which were a little bit of sort of word puzzles, 
people, like we did with the announcement of Jurassic World. Yes. Um, and maybe for practical reasons that people with hindsight did see, and I think it was quite a fun guessing game. I, I think since Planet Coaster came out, the scepticism e eased quite a lot. And then it was really put to bed when we announced Jurassic. You know, they, they saw that we had a cadence, that we were delivering, we were doing what we said we'd do, and also that the games were performing. People saw them for their, with their own eyes, going right to the top of the Steam charts and any other charts that, that monitor digital sales. And, you know, that, that we have maged on digital, even with Jurassic, which we did do on physical, um, we did a digital first launch so that the people who weren't, weren't sure which they wanted got digital. You know, so uh, that, and that's so much better for our bottom line anyway. Um, but I, I think, you know, overall, I think the experience wasn't a bad one. And I think what we've also done is we've laid the path to quite a few other companies who would have found it a lot harder had we not waited. Yeah, no, interesting. And so may, maybe we should just talk a little bit about the, the games that you've written uh, as, as a business since the float. And obviously the first one was Elite Dangerous, which is very personal to you. Uh, where, where you obviously became very well known uh, at university for writing the original game with a friend. And, um, and I, probably little did you think that uh, this many years later you would be still producing versions of that game. But clearly the, the, first, the first rewrite was very successful and uh, I now understand there's a major new chapter coming next year. Um, but how, how do you you have a very long personal journey with this game. Is it still very special to you? Does it still feel? Oh, it's, it's still very special. I mean, I've always had, I, I've always loved uh, astronomy and looking up at the stars and just the feeling that, you know, how small Earth is and all that sort of thing. And to be able to communicate that in any medium actually is really good. And it's very rare in um, films that you get that feeling of, of the vastness out there. So yes, I'm really proud of it. I'm still very close to it. Um, you know, for, for those listening, Elite Dangerous, actually, the um, original Early Access came out seven years ago. It's in its seventh year, so it's an amazingly long time ago. Um, that was that first al alpha in um, December 2013. You know, and after that, it's, it's, it's gone from strength to strength, to be fair. It's gone from console, first Xbox and PlayStation. And we've got, we said there's an update coming later, which for, it, it was previously due in December. We just we pushed it into the new year because that's actually sensible because there have been some slight delays with COVID, um, but only probably only small numbers of days at each end. But I, we're just wanting to be sure, you know, because we're so close to Christmas, we don't want to push it right into Christmas and have problems. Um, having said that, you know, it's, it's a game we're very close to. You know, we just, Fleet Carriers is in beta at the moment, as you may or may not know. Um, that's going out very well. Our first public beta on console, which is, is quite an achievement because it's much more complicated to do it on console because of approvals, Microsoft and Sony both have to be involved. And because we're dealing on the same servers on all the platforms, it has to be updated at the same time. So there are some technical challenges there as well. Wow, fantastic. And then there was Planet Coaster came after that and another very successful on-time development. Yeah, Planet Coaster came out on time in November um, 2016. Um, and actually, you know, that, that was the other thing. I think there was scepticism because at that point, the, the go-to coaster game was Roller Coaster Tycoon 3, which we had developed, but with Atari um, back in 2004. And I think where there was scepticism is that we could go with what was basically a new IP. Um, Roller Coaster Tycoon brand was not owned by Frontier, it was owned um, by Chris Sawyer and Atari. And we did look at taking it over, but just practically speaking, it wasn't practical. And actually, we were confident it wasn't the brand, it was the quality of the game that mattered. And I think within a day or so, it was really apparent that that's exactly what's happened. And even to the extent that the day before we released, Atari announced a game called Roller Coaster Tycoon World as a notional sequel, which didn't even compare favorably to Roller Coaster Tycoon 3, never mind to um, Planet Coaster. So I think that's gone from strength to strength. And nowadays, it's the go-to coaster game and has been pretty well ever since we released. Yeah. You know, so that's really good. And it goes to the strategy as well that we did say at the start, was to identify underserved areas of the market that we can do a great game in and do a great game in it. Because then you've got a really good chance of owning that sector, even if it's a little bit niche. 
they're still quite big niches, especially when you think that we're selling to a global audience now. And not necessarily, to, we won't, we're not going to go head to head with Call of Duty, because to match that, you need quite a big investment. And I'm not actually sure you'll get a return. You know, and if anything, looking at what games like Fortnite did, where they did a game that had some functionality a bit like it, so it's first person shooter, but quite a different style of game, it's actually taken away quite a big slice of their audience. You know, Activision have fought back by adding a, um, they call it a Battle Royale mode to Call of Duty, and that's been quite successful for them. So that, again, it's that arms race, and arms races can be quite expensive because yeah. you have to do them quickly. Um, and so the fields we're in, we're, we're actually away from that real fierce um, competition. And the strategy, and we've seen it now a ton of poster um, over those years since we released it, where roughly quarterly we've been bringing out expansions. So we, we stay ahead of the game. It's quite hard for people to challenge that. If you look at the amount of really valuable rich content that, that's in that game. Um, yes, at some point, I, I suspect we will want to do a new version, the same way we did Roller Coaster Tycoon 3. Um, yeah. But, you know, it, it's a very good, it's a good business model for us. And we've announced it coming to console now. You know, so, so there's a good throughput of, of things there. And I think the other thing is we've sort of learned, because we're learning every day. And we're learning now as how best to do things under the lockdown. But with Planet Coaster, we started off doing quarterly updates. And we actually noticed, I mean, we noticed pretty quickly, we did a trial, when you do the updates is really important. And the sweet spot is to do it just before a holiday period. Um, because that way you can get people who, you know, an established word of mouth, just at the point where um, people expect to be buying games, you know, whether it's Thanksgiving, whether it's Christmas, whether it's um, Easter is good, and also the summer sales season is good. So what we've done is rather than being actually calendar quarterly, we've skewed them a bit. So that the updates tend to come before those holiday periods. Um, and that has that's been a bit of a kick up in the sales. So even you know, so they're not uniformly spread through the year. Um, you're now seeing that we've done it with Jurassic, we've had a number of updates. Um, similarly with Planet Zoo, it's still early days, but we've got um, those two big updates out, and they have been doing incredibly well for us, particularly the South America pack, which by the way was produced under lockdown. Wow. Released on time just before Easter. Um, and, you know, that's done really well for us. Uh, and I, I think it's partly because if you think of lockdown as being a multiplier on sales, you know, it's been really good to us. And we've seen various different sort of characteristics that have changed. Um, you know, we look at our, we, we see all our sales graphs, we see our sales, um, you know, through the week. And you can see there's the periodicity, the weekends, Friday nights, Saturday night, really good, Sunday's pretty good. And then it dips during the week. It's always been like that. But actually, nowadays, it's very hard to see those dips. You know, I, I think we might see it as people start to go back to work. We might see it starting to reappear. Like we did in China. We've seen things reappear in China. Um, but interestingly, sales in China have been higher since they've gone back than they were beforehand. So I wonder if um, you know, more people have bought PCs as they went into lockdown. Um, you know, so, so I, I think uh, and we already know that gaming is quite sticky. If you build up a good group of good friends in an environment, whether it's in the pub or whether it's in a game, I think you're more likely to want to try and keep in touch with them. Yeah. And that's a bit anecdotal, not scientific. But we certainly have seen positivity in the countries that as a lockdown eases. And there's an amount of watching this space, to be honest, as well. Um, you know, it, it's still early days. We don't know quite how the lockdown is going to get lifted. And, and exactly what, what the cadence of that's going to be. Um, but, you know, it, it's good for us. And the fact that work from home is actually working quite well for us. Do, do you find that you lose any productivity with working from home? Um, we lost, I mean, fortunately, the good thing was we actually moved to working from home about a week before the lockdown. Um, because it enabled us, we were moving over 500 people and making sure they've got the kit, making sure they've got the network connections, the VPN, all that sort of thing. And there's actually a lot of almost removals type of work, of taking workstations home, particularly people who don't have cars, and also making sure insurance network, all of those sort of things are sorted. Um, but having said that, I, I think we see different people are more efficient than others. There was, I think we see, we're seeing a range. Some people are probably more than 100% efficient if you compare working from home but I think as the team looks at, it's probably below 100%. Yeah. 
but not vastly so, not the 0% as we see with a lot of furloughed companies. And I think part of it, what worries me is the longer term, which is mentoring younger people. Yeah. You know, we've got graduates who've probably only been at Frontier a few months, very keen, very able people. And there is an effect which people usually don't like to admit where they sidle across to their colleague, friend and say, look, I can't quite figure out how this thing's working. Whereas if you make it a bit more formal with a, a Teams call or a Zoom call, Zoom call you're more likely to, to struggle for longer before mm -hmm. you make that call. Yeah. You know, so I, I think there are things that we haven't got enough metrics on yet, but I, I think team leads are probably actually, you find there are fewer distractions, but those distractions <laughs> can be valuable. Yeah, yes. Yeah, I think that, so the office is not dead, basically. We, we, we will want to go back in time. I don't, I don't think it is, but I think there probably will be more homeworking mm -hmm. yeah. um, afterwards. Once, we, once we've established, and, and, and some people actually, we've, we've got really good internet connections at home, for example. Others haven't. You know, we've given people 4G dongles and all that sort of thing. But for some of our heavy workstation work, that's actually slows things down quite a lot. So the, there's the sort of semi-geographical effect as well. Um, so we would have to look at that. But having said that, yes, I think things will change. They won't be the same. And actually, we have completely changed the way we work. I mean, one of the great things with our industry is it's so fast moving anyway, always has been. You know, new technologies come along. We're, we're currently dealing with um, PlayStation 5 and Xbox Next, for example. You know, that we're continually adapting to these new ways of working, new, new retail channels as well, which we've gone on to. Um, and so working from home is just another adaptation we've had to make. And we made it really relatively quickly in a small number of weeks. You know, we planned it out and we started moving from home, a team at a time, um, and worked out how people engage with the servers, whether it's better using VPN with a workstation at home versus screen, you know, um, remote desktop type working. You know, and I think we've got a way of working that's working okay. It's, it's getting better. I think for some people, they're finding it a bit of a struggle. That's the other thing, psychologically. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm sure you've had Zoom crowd calls where a toddler runs into the room. Daddy, daddy! <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think it, it's, it feels okay for a certain period of time, yeah. but not forever. Yeah. I think quite a lot of people are itching to get back. Yeah, no, I understand that. And for school to reopen. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought it might be worth just going back to two of the big sort of inflection points that happened in 2017 yeah. for the company when, first of all, um, you were you signed up a what was not named but would later became named as Jurassic World as a as a licensee approached by Universal Pictures to um, to, to take on this task of writing the game for their next episode of the film. Yeah. And I think that in a way that was, that was when the market really changed its perception of the company from developing games that you'd, you know, new versions of games you'd written before to really having this, um, to, to being an engine of, of new games. And, and this was something that looked scalable uh, and, and clearly looked very exciting and it was gonna take you to a, a, an even bigger audience. Um, and of course, the other thing that happened in that year was Tencent invested in the company and uh, bought, I think, ten something like ten percent of the of the company. Just um, under ten percent. It was it's about nine percent. And and those two things um, sort of, I think, woke the market up to the potential of the business. I mean, first of all, what, what was it like getting the call from Universal, and, and was that a new experience, or was that something that had those kind of things happened before? Oh yeah, I mean, we we. We had quite regularly talked to people in the um, in the Hollywood area. I mean, we've done quite a few licenses, but on a small scale. If you think of what we did with Ghostbusters and Planet Coaster, yeah. for example, that was Sony Pictures. You know, and um, I, I think they work quite well. But I, th I think what was ironic is we were wanting to do something with dinosaurs anyway, and it, it just came at almost the perfect perfect time. And we engaged with them. They're, they're great people to work with. Um, it's been very very positive experience and hopefully for them as well you know and our relationship with them is is really good and so i, I think we in, in a in our minds this is the, the funny thing um we're always sort of at least two years further on because the things that we're signing now i mean actually you've got some sight of it because obviously i mean we'll talk about it in a minute but formula one and then games workshop um you know those details obviously we've been talking to them for quite a while 
And there are other things we're looking at in the future that are really exciting and interesting, where you can see how the business scales. Um, and of course, the third party publishing, actually being a publisher for other people, is something that I think is, is really getting a life of its own. And the beauty with that side of the business is an easy business, it's an easy part of the business to scale because recruitment in that area is not particularly confined. Um, it, the key thing is that we publish good games that we can be proud of, that we think will do okay in the market. Yeah. Do you, th do you think there's, is the window of opportunity still open for developers to become publishers or is that, have the barriers to entry now risen quite a bit? Uh, I think probably mostly closed. I think it depends, you need a leg up to do it um, at, at now. When we became publishers, we, there was that window actually, which David Gammon referred to, because we could see it opening, we could also see it closing. And that was the other reason um, to go to market, to make sure we had the ability to do that. Um, and the plan always was to do it on our own ticket with our own games, and then potentially add to it later. You know, that was one of our potential upsides down the line, we could publish other people's games, even back then. Um, although we didn't shout too much about it because it doesn't, you know, it wasn't particularly current at that time. I, I think the, the key thing was there were very few digital publishers at that time compared to now. And also, if you look at um, digital portals like Steam, like Xbox Live, like the PlayStation Store, um, they were nowhere near as noisy as they are now. It was possible for a small company and that the problem is actually not just size it's number of products mm. you know, a, a, a one product small company that has something that appears in the steam charts and then dribbles down again firstly that's not terribly interesting to valve to engage with the company that runs steam and also engaging with customers it gives it's harder now the beauty of the sorts of games we're doing is that we've got updates you know roughly quarterly and that means actually we've got new stories much more often than that um, so that's already a big head start. Uh, and then as soon as we had our second game, Planet Coaster, we had much more of a, of, of a throughput of information. Then we started talking, once we started talking about Jurassic, you know, there, there was, and I think at that point onwards, we'd, we'd crossed the hump and we, we, were, we were there. You know what I mean? We had, we started doing publisher sales with, with Valve. We could do takeovers of their homepage and all that sort of thing. And it, it reminds me, talking to one of the third party publishing groups, um, they said to me they had never spoken to a person at Valve. Wow. Whereas we speak to them most days, you know, and that's the difference. So we can talk about what, what's forthcoming, how things aren't working, can we change this on the page? You know, and it, it's that, that the people who are being published through us, they get that relationship benefit because they can participate in our Steam sales. I mean, we had a publisher sale over the Easter weekend, which was incredible for us. Um, and, you know, a part of why we ended up um, nudging up the numbers. Um, but it was, that was a frontier publisher sale over the Easter weekend, which would have been great anyway. But it was that sort of magnifying effect because of COVID, and that quite early on in the lockdown period, where people were still scratching their heads thinking where they should spend their money. <laughs> then we were going, hey, we're here. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And may maybe a good place to finish would be, I, I know you have a, a, a wonderful vision of the future and what you want the company to do over the next 10 years. Could you maybe just sort of talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's not, it's not changed hugely, but I, I think in, in five to 10 years time, certainly sort of 10 years time, I imagine there will be something like a dozen media companies. Um, and none of them will look anything like they do today. Uh, in the same way, if you wind back 10 years, you wouldn't recognize Amazon you know, or Netflix. And there will be some familiar ones as well. But we want to be one of those companies. We will also be unrecognizable, by the way. But I think actually we're, we're fairly unrecognizable than when we floated, when we first chatted. You know, we were quite a small company then. Mm -hmm. We had, we didn't have a lot of development power, firepower, we didn't have a lot of cash. We've now got a lot of cash, a lot of development firepower. We're now very well known in the industry as well. So recruitment for us now is better than it's ever been. And actually during, during lockdown, you know, we've recruited a lot of people. Wow. And, you know, we, we haven't engaged with it in any um, furloughing or anything like that, even with people that we could have furloughed, because I think 
the key thing is companies like us, we shouldn't be taking those things. You know, we are doing incredibly well, and we're very proud of that. Um, but also, we're trying to make sure that we treat our staff really well. You know, by having well-being sessions and all this sort of thing, um, people that they can talk to privately. Because I think some people are struggling with it more than others. People who, are sadly, quite young people who might be working in the same room that they're sleeping. Mm. You know, just because they're in a shared house and they don't have a lot of space. Um, you know, and they get outside for one walk a day. And then, yes, I know you can do more than that now, but, you know, I think that gets to people. And so we've tried to look after people and we've tried to run events in the evening, the film night tonight, for example, where people are watching a film, but they're all getting to chat about it while they're watching it. Right, great. Yeah. You know, it, it's really to try and keep that feeling of community going, which would otherwise have been served by things like our canteen and our after work activities, which sadly we can't do at the moment. Maybe we will be able to do them in a few weeks' time, who knows? Yeah, fantastic. David, great to chat to you. Thank you very much for taking part in, uh, in this conversation. You're very welcome. Thanks for, thanks for having me. And, and thanks for investing, by the way, and to all your investors. It's appreciated. Well, I should pass on thanks for our investors because you, you've been amongst our most successful yeah. investments and it's been a real privilege to be an investor in your company. So Onwards thanks. and upwards. Indeed. Thanks, Paul. Great. No, thank you.